Wind howled through the night, carrying a scent that would change the world. Aragon. Prologue. Shade of Fear. Welcome to Aragon and Back Again, a podcast where we explore Christopher Paolini's inheritance cycle, one chapter at a time. I'm Darian Smart. And I am Lucy Hart. And it begins. And it begins. It has begun. It has begun. It has started. Begin the begins. <laughs> Begin the begins, Griffin. Griffin. <laughs> oh, this is going to be fun. This is going to be fun. I'm excited. Uh, and nervous. Let's, uh, yes. Oh, yes. Because Lucy, Lucy, my dear, my dear Lucia, Hello. this Hello. is your first podcast. Yes. This is the first time being on mic and speaking for a show that which you are a host of. Yep. How are we weird. feeling? It's weird. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's okay. You know, I'm, I'm rolling excited. up with three active podcasts. So yeah, right? Oh, my just, God. Just another Wednesday for Darian. <laughs> but here we are. We're talking about... Uh, it's. Listen, I'm going to say this up top. We know it's the inheritance cycle. Will I be calling it the Aragon series probably a lot? Yes. yes. I probably yes. will. <laughs> That'll yes. probably be what I end up saying. But yes, this episode, we're just going to talk about the prologue. Very short, but that's because we're also going to do this whole let's introduce ourselves to the listeners thing that yep. I personally love. So, Lucy. Yes. Here is something I think the audience needs to know. You and I are both professional writers. Yeah. <laughs> yes. pause, long pause for a second being like, okay, technically... Professional means getting paid, and there was a time when we were both paid when writers. We were both paid writers, we have and left no longer. That job. And yes. that is all I'm legally allowed to say about that. Yeah, you can say more, but I can't. <laughs> it, so it wasn't great, and ah, so we left. <laughs> and so we left dramatically in some cases. Yes, but I bring that up at the top because our approach. I believe you and I have talked about this a lot, so I want to uh, set expectations with our listeners. Is I believe our approach will likely be a mix of talking about the book and reacting to the book, but also breaking down how each chapter is working in in a mechanical sense, right? In that storytelling sense, yep. coming from a writer's perspective. Yeah, talking about how like different themes fit in, kind of like maybe like because this isn't this isn't our first time reading these books. No, mm-mm, um, mm-mm. Uh, we should so also we've read them that, before. Yes. Yes. And it's just like, so it's touching also about like, oh, hey, this was a touch of foreshadowing um, Mm -hmm. or just like just like different themes and how that works in and just like how certain things are written to portray certain themes and stuff like that. Yeah. And and anything like we notice, good thing, bad thing, weird thing. Yeah. Sometimes if we're going to be talking about something, it's not necessarily, wow, this was bad. It's more just like this existed. And I know this did. And I'd like to break down what it maybe means. Yep. Yep. Uh, because yeah. I see also, while we're not being actively like paid copywriters at the moment, Lucy, you're actively working on a novel. Yes, I'm and writing. just so much slow writing. Slow and steady. <laughs> Very slowly. Yeah. But yes. Yeah. And I spend my summers working at a writing camp for kids. So yes. we come with credentials. Yes. But we hope you will stay for our charming and delightful personalities. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. So with that, Lucy, do you remember the first time you read the Aragon books? See, I already I did, did it. I did. I do. So, and this is like, this is the 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 thing I wanted to say, like mm-hmm. that I've been like hinting at. Since oh, it's like, right. We're going to talk is, about. Right. You yes. wanted to tell me. Oh my gosh. Yes. Okay. So I I've don't had... know. I don't. Yeah. So I don't actually know if I've told you this before. Okay. Or not, but. So when I first read the book series, I honestly think it was like the first time I picked up a book that that like I never read a book with a prologue before. Oh, okay, yeah. And so I picked this one up and I didn't know what it was and I was scared it would spoil stuff for me, so I didn't read the prologue. You did. And read I just the pro- <laughs> I didn't read the prologue in my first read through and I just nope. jumped into the first chapter. You've never told me that. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> so I just went in like completely blind as to like what hap- like what happened previously. So you just so this let's let's you weren't a grown up at this time. Obviously you were like a maybe early middle schooler. Yeah, it was like I think it was like 
if not early high school, like mm-hmm. the middle of middle school or somewhere in there. Yeah. Because so, I had been reading the Harry Potter novels and they do not have a prologue. They yeah, just honestly. Jump in. Yeah. So they just jump in. So it was like, and it, and it like, again, just like any other books I hadn't, I don't know if I was like super avid reader at that point, but like the Spiderwick novel, the Spiderwick, mm-hmm. Spiderwick novels and like Chronicles, I think that is. And yeah. then like things like that. But it was like, I hadn't read a book before with a prologue. So I didn't know what it was. So I was just like, and we're just going to skip this because I don't know anything about what's happened like i think i read like the first line and i was like oh my god this is gonna spoil stuff for me and so i just skipped oh, it that is <laughs> no, you've never told me that that is delightful yeah. uh i was also thinking potter and that first mm-hmm. chapter that it, it, i was thinking like why is this a prologue and and that's that's the first mechanic things we can talk about what mm-hmm. like when do you do add a prologue i don't i feel like because it's like in my novel, I am writing a prologue. Mm-hmm. And I feel like a prologue does allow the readers to read something that's like, like you could, like, I feel like you, a prologue's pretty flexible. Like you can go, you don't even have to hone in on the first, like your main character in it. You can go uh-huh. completely different yeah. and just explore like different themes. And it lets the reader know just like, some stuff that's going behind the background that the main character doesn't know but it's kind of like a teaser for the readers so they're just gonna be like because in mine in my prologue i start off with this main character i start off with this character fig and then it jumps into this other my main character jenka who might change i don't know and she it's but it's like it's like a thing where and then like fig is not brought up again for a very long time but it has Mm -hmm. the readers like i guess spoilers a little bit Uh. (laughs) but it's like it'll have like readers looking for these characters like when are they gonna pop up like what's Mm -hmm. happening and so and i i do feel like it's also like a little friendly wave like when the readers are able to be like oh we read that in the prologue and they don't know but we know kind of yeah so I think I yeah I think that's it it's it's setting when you start your story in a place where your POV character isn't mm-hmm. I think is is a major just or or when there's like massive time set up yeah cuz I was thinking like honestly first chat and again all right we keep referencing Potter but that's what we've got right now yeah <laughs> uh, is cuz I can't think of another honestly I'm having a hard time a thinking of another type of book that has a chapter that starts quite like this that is or isn't a prologue, and two thinking of another book that starts in not the character's POV. And I know there are tons, and I know I have read yeah. tons, but yeah. I, for the life of me, cannot think of another one right now. So here we are. Yep. <laughs> I would almost say that first chapter, you know, it it takes it like shifts POV, but it does not come from who will be our central point of view character for the rest of the series. Mm-hmm. And it starts out 11 years before the books actually really start. Take place, yeah. Yeah, 10 years or so. Mm-hmm. And it is nine years or so, whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Somewhere and in there. It could. It almost could be an, a prologue mm-hmm. because it is so set apart from the rest of what you're reading. Like, I think that is why this... What the prologue here is the prologue because it is, for my knowledge, I think the rest of the series is going to be from Aragon's point of view. Like, we yep. don't switch POVs. Like, maybe in other prologues. I don't remember. But the rest of it's going to be from Aragon's point of view. So it's from someone else's POV, the Shade, in mm-hmm. this case. And it is... But it's not long, long ago. Like, as we'll yep. find out, what happens to the prog- prologue feels like it probably overlaps a little with with what we're about to get into or what we will get into next in chapter one yep and that's just the thing that's just the thing i noticed is that i feel like it could have just been chapter one a shade of fear i think Mm -hmm. it's a prologue because it is in a different character's pov yeah i also think like it might be i i honestly can't remember if Mm -hmm. um the the aragon series inheritance cycle Eh. (laughs) uh is is if it's a, a young adult novel I, yeah or a kid's novel because i feel like harry potter is like that borderline of young adults but also kids because mm-hmm. it is more especially the first one the first one is definitely more for like i read that in elementary school so yeah like, i would just keep referring to the harry potter just because <laughs> gang we know uh, hey listen yeah. we know like no we, we know we know we get it but like 
or no. So the yeah. thing about it is, I think middle grade is kind mm-hmm. of where it ends up when you can't tell if it's child or you can't tell if it's like YA. Yeah. It's like middle grade. But I, I, I feel like oh, you're talking about this. I don't remember what the conversation, but like trying to like if the fact that Aragon is published as like a kid, like a middle grade or like YA high fantasy, I think it's part of the reason why it blew up so big. Because mm-hmm. it is by no reason by no means like the first major like fantasy book for kids. Yeah. But I also think maybe it almost is. For this mm-hmm. kind of fantasy, this very this Tolkien esque kind of inspired yeah. fantasy. Like you mentioned Spiderwick earlier. I read Fablehaven yep. and stuff. Yep. Those are fantasy. Those deal with like magic worlds, but not not the same way this like this like, when you get into like that hefty text of yep. of of that those like major high fantasies, those major worlds that usually tend to lean more adult fantasy, maybe YA. And I think part of the appeal that Aragon got was kids getting to read these kind of fantasy story many of them for the first time this is definitely like yeah. i had not even like i pretty sure i watched the lord of the rings movies at this point in time but they weren't like a huge like point i hadn't read any of those books i still haven't mm-hmm. read those books i'm probably not gonna yeah. read those books gang <laughs> <laughs> yeah but this was the thing that introduced me to the idea of fantasy at this scope yeah like i think a lot of people who are like Christopher Christopher Paolini fans or just like the Aragon series fans Mm -hmm. is that they know that Lord of the Rings and that kind of like high high rote fantasy Mm -hmm. was a huge influence to this oh someone yeah we could say influence (laughs) we could use other words (laughs) we could say if it wasn't published by his folks maybe it wouldn't be like this yeah (laughs) yeah but that's it was not the conversation like, we're here to have today. Yeah, but it's like with that, with when Lord of the Rings and like that kind of stuff was just intimidating for a lot of like yeah. middle schooler, even high schoolers, where that's like, that's a lot. Like they watch the movies and they're like, sweet. And then they try to read the book and they're like, oh no. Oh no. <laughs> kind oh no. Of thing. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it is definitely like, e- I w- cut, I've listened to it. I've listened to Lord of the Rings. I haven't read Lord of the Rings, uh-huh. but like, I understand like how tough that could read and then aragon does read easier it still has that same kind of uh vibe as lord of the rings does but it's not like heavy or difficult yeah it's not being written like that yeah that's definitely true and i will i will uh i'll say a phrase that i got from my dear dear friend dylan hunter many years ago we stand on the shoulders of giants yep it can that yep, is yep, not yep. good or bad that it is so similar to Lord of the Rings. It is just a fact and it's similar to a lot of things that we will certainly talk about as we go on. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. for now, yep, also read this when I was in like seventh grade, I think is when I started. I remember mm-hmm. being so upset when I found out that the third book was going to actually be two more books and the series wasn't over yet. Yep. I just wanted it all. I just wanted to read <laughs> it all. But yeah, shall we get into the prologue? Yes, let's. Should we? Should we do like a brief? Here's what happened, or I don't know. Let's just roll with it. And then, dear listeners, if you have uh, thoughts, ways that we could be doing this show that'll make it more enjoyable, understandable for your listening experience, hit us up. We're at Aragon Pod on Instagram and Aragon Pod at Gmail dot com. Yeah, for now. For now. <laughs> well, no, sorry. For now, let's get into what oh, we're gonna now. do. There we yeah. go. There we go. Uh, I feel you. I feel you. I do. I do like the kind of like this is what happened. Yeah. Aspect to it. Do you want to, especially with the prologue, just because it's so short. It's so short. Yeah. Do you want to, Luce? Do you want to then, in that case, briefly summarize what happened in the prologue? Okay. Yeah. So in the in the prologue, we get we are introduced to this uh, character, the Shade, and we don't necessarily know uh, anything about him except like his inner with like all we know on him and his character is just how he's interacting with the world around him and Mm -hmm. the one of the the big thing for me it was like when i when i was when i read this uh much later after i listened to the actually read the prologue for the first time and Uh then re-listening and reading it this time it was he just gives off such 
I am the bad guy vibes. Mm -hmm. And it's like in every every little aspect of what he does because he's because like I, I think like one of the first lines he's one of the first one of the first things he says to like his orcs who is like his minions is he's uh, like yeah, the, the Urgals. Yeah. And he says stop whoever's coming or die. And that's like a whoa like that mm -hmm. seems to take it from like one to a hundred real freaking fast but all right and then he also he calls them tools they're they uh they were tools nothing more mm -hmm. and just so he's like and then he also like uh burns the forest down with like no regard to anything like that and then like when um this elf woman uh sends this like I don't, I, I think he, I think he, they refer to it as a stone. Yeah, they... I want to talk about that. So we're going to up front. Okay, so I, I believe as we discussed, our goal is to be a spoiler free podcast. Yep. So we're only going to discuss what we know in these books. C can we discuss the things that we know are super obvious? I don't know. <laughs> well, I'm over here because I want to talk about the stone thing. And and the yeah. fact that it's called a stone, how that doesn't work here mechanically. Yeah. That's a big writing thing that I want to talk about. Okay, the, the, the fucking back of the book says, when Aragorn finds a polished blue stone in the forest, he thinks that is a lucky discovery of a poor farm boy. But when the stone brings a ha dragon hatchling, Aragorn soon realizes he has stumbled upon a legacy nearly as old as the Empire itself. Should we have read the back of the book at the top of this? Maybe, maybe okay. you can cut that in. <laughs> okay, now, uh, okay, okay. I'm gonna say stone. It's a dragon egg. We know it's a dragon egg because it says so on the back of the book. And if it says so yep. on the back of the book, we can talk about it. So okay, that I'll works. Put a, that I'll works. put a pin in that. But we know he is after a dragon egg that yep. this elf woman is carrying with her two guards through the forest. We don't know yep. why. We don't know whether we're yep. taking it. But mm -hmm. and I, I'm gonna. That's towards the end of the chapter where I want to talk a little bit more about okay. the stone of it all. But yeah. Yeah. Another thing though, like when speaking of like how we know he's like, this is like this is a bad guy. Like I think mm -hmm. that's a big thing of this prologue is to set up this this being as our villain. He looked human, except for his crimson hair and maroon eyes. Because red hair equals not human, apparently. <laughs> like I get it, but also I don't know. Crimson's yeah. just red. I think like I I I, I can see the problematic it's also like not not problematic silly it's yes yeah, silly silly silly, <laughs> silly yes and it's also like i think okay so i know the movie and we'll talk about the movie later how the <laughs> movie just, uh, maybe uh how the movie like has him looking where it's like i if i'm i only watched it oh, once yeah. i've got the book i've got is one i picked up from the used bookstore it is a movie oh yeah cover. there he is there he is Yep. So, like, with that My best blood friend in high red. school had hair exactly like <laughs> this bright, fiery, bright crimson red. red. Yeah, that is exactly what her hair looked like. I'm yeah. not exaggerating. I can yep. pull up pictures of this bitch. That's wonderful. So, but it was like it was it, for me. It was like it almost is like blood red. I feel I like blood red would have been yeah. a better. And I think that might have been uh, if you want to stay away from inhuman apart from his red hair. And it's like, well, people have red hair. Yeah, Chris, <laughs> it it's doesn't like... make them inhuman. But if it was if if they literally just had like blood red. Blood I think it's just hair. it's just a silly thing that yeah. caught me up. I was like, OK, like <laughs> I feel like maroon eyes could have that could have just maroon been your eyes, yes. is that his maroon eyes bet. Yeah, bet. The maroon eyes that glared from beneath crimson hair. Except I hate it when they describe features. Here's another thing I don't like is when their POV characters describing their own features. Mm hmm. And the shade is our POV. It's weird because it's like we're watching from like a camera that's yeah. like showing on this. So it's because it, if it also, was in what is first that? person. Yeah, it's third person limited. Something like that. Yes, because first person is when I, me, I'm telling you the story. Yeah. Third person is when there's an external force telling you the story, and third person yep. limited is when they only have information of one or specific characters. So I would yep. say this is third person. And even then, it bothers me in third person limited. I get yep. it. It's different than first person, but I know you're telling me, but you also are inside this guy's head. I don't know why it bothers. I mean, I know why it bothers me, <laughs> but... I've been, I don't know if the, I've been listening to these books that are like, 
how to make your writing better and like stuff like that. And a lot of I, I God, I can't remember exactly what it says, but it's like when describing your characters, you want to do it in a like flawless way that you're not like and their eyes were this big and their lips were cupid shaped and mm-hmm. their hair was this long and this color and their tone skin tone was this color and blah 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 because that just pages and pages and pages of just yeah, don't need that awfulness so like i think like one of the biggest cliches is having the character look mm-hmm. into a mirror and then yeah describe Tell your you features what they see. that way mm-hmm. and because i think bringing in twilight that's how bella describes herself after she transforms into a vampire she looks Mm -hmm. into a mirror and she's like oh the perfect girl looking back at me except and she's like she can kind of see the flaws but not really yeah kind of thing i would almost i would almost defend the mirror thing when it is after a major transformation yes i yes okay i can yes i see that i see that but I've seen that in other things where it's like I looked in the mirror and I saw like in like pulp horror stuff. Yeah. Like, yeah. Why pulp horror is like and this is what it's I don't know. It's not so bad here, especially because like the point isn't necessarily to describe the character, but to distinguish that he is not human. Yes. And I, I don't mind that. I just I get it's the silly thing that I got a little hung up on. I'll admit that. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit about the Urgles who are, are basically orcs, right? Like we can. They're, yeah. they're orcs. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, they're, yes, basically orcs. Yeah, they're described as, they resembled men with bowed legs and thick, brutish arms made for crushing. And and that's the only, I think they also mentioned they have horns later yep. on at one point in time. And they smell terrible. They, they smelled like fetid meat. Yep. I want to talk a little bit about this, this prologue is establishing our villains and our monsters. Yep. Mm-hmm. And how many times the Urgles are called monster or creature? Five times. Yeah. It's five times I count. <laughs> and these like like half dozen pages, if that. Yep. And and this is again from the the shade POV. Yep. But it's it's interesting because basically at it's setting the reader against the these Urgles, these beings like right out the gate. Mm -hmm. because they're like obviously they're the bad guys obviously they're about to attack something they're waiting to ambush somebody Uh, eyes brightened under the urgles thick brows and the creatures grip their weapons tighter and they are at stark contrast to who their target is these elves three white horses with riders cantered towards the ambush their heads held high and proud on the first horse was an elf with pointed ears and elegantly slanted eyebrows, which I noticed, which I noted because like not three paragraphs earlier, the Urgles had thick brows and yeah. there was a distinct difference, difference in the visuals. In like the elegance and the brute. Yeah. Like trying to establish like this is what is brutish and monstrous and evil in this world. And this is what mm-hmm. is like, they're literally on white horses, gay. <laughs> Come on. But also it's like these like how they're called creature monster. There's essentially being presented as if they are horde like beasts, wolves or skeletons you've risen from the ground. Mm-hmm. But we also know that's not the case because actually the first description we get is around him shuffled 12 orgles with short swords and round shields painted with black symbols. They have a language. Yep. There is they have weaponry, they have language, they have creation. They have they're not just animals. Yes. But that's not the way that they are presented to us in this chapter. Mm-hmm. Or or it could also be the the way just the also they have black blood, black Urgle blood. If you want to talk about like how to set apart that character who we're supposed to know is good versus character who being told is bad. Yeah. Literally making their insides different is a pretty common mm-hmm. trope to pull as well. Again, these are not thing bad. This is more just like Thing I clocked. Ob- observing. Oh, yeah. Observe, Observation. Yeah. Yep. The horned monsters came out of the forest. So just, yeah, mon- like just how to like make a monster. And so by the end of the prologue, we get our shades are big, bad, powerful guy. And these Urgles are just like these horde beasts we need to fear. Yep. It's also the Urgles are also portrayed in a way that they're not very smart mm-hmm. because where the shade can like 
And also just more like, I guess it goes again to the elegant kind of thing because the Urgles are loud and grunting at each other and they're like shuffling around mm -hmm. and the shade is just standing stock still and not moving and mm -hmm. doing anything. And like, so it's almost implying that they don't know how to be quiet. And honestly, when I was listening to this again, I was like, how did the horses and stuff like not hear them if they were yes. making that much noise mm -hmm. about shuffling and grunting and breaking twigs and because like they were also standing there for an hour waiting so for these people so to come long. walking through yeah. and so it was just like very much just wild to me I was just like I'm like oh so the horses are gonna pick them up and it's like the horses only pick up the ergles when the breeze changes and then mm -hmm. the or urgle smell comes wafting through yeah. which is wild because apparently they smell so bad yeah it's wild that it just took the breeze because they were right on them by the time mm -hmm. they, the horses clocked it so i'm like wild and the elves are supposed to have this like hyper sense and stuff yep. like that and also so i just thought about this uh -huh. if the shade could sniff and smell the elves and the horses f an hour away and it wasn't overpowered by the Urkel stench? Right. Because... I'm, I'm thinking, really, <laughs> what we needed to do is stop. And, like, everyone's taking a shower. We're just all going to take... There you go. Because that's another thing is, like, saying, oh, they stink. They're wretched. They don't know how to clean themselves. That's also a thing that's, like, adding to that these are monstrous creatures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they, like, right out the gate. So three elves. The two dude elves, they are cut down immediately by the Urkels. Yep. They're, like, the arrows get them. Yep. And stuff. And then our, our lady elf in the middle is like fleeing. And yep. the Urgles are chasing her. Well, first they want to go to the elves that they slayed. Yep. And the shade is the one that's like, no, after her, she's the after, one I want. She's the one I want. And that's after he kills because they were all bolting away on their horses. And the Urgles shot down the two uh, male elves and mm -hmm. their riders. And then the shade shot down her horse yeah and then she stumbled and then looked back and that was when she saw her el her el fellow elves who had fallen and then and then the urgles like rush over to their kill to who knows yeah that's and another that's when he's thing like, i clocked is like monstrous yep and he go and there was no like it, it's like no you guys like go after the girl the she mm -hmm. right there it's go like, after hey, Olympus her is she's that the one way. i want yeah, yeah. and so uh, then they, oh, okay, yeah, and then they, <laughs> they all start trying. And again, it just kind of dings the, they're not very bright, whereas the shade is significantly smarter. Yeah. Or kind of like the vibe you're getting. Mm -hmm. We do see, like, as you said, he he kills the, the horse, and that's the first time we see magic. And yep. we're told that this story will have active magic. Yep. So he... Which is exciting. That's always yes! exciting. When magic... I'm always excited to see a magic yep. system. Tell me more. Yep. So he jumped, the shade jumped out from behind a tree, raised his right hand, and shouted something. Gargula. Gargula. <laughs> is, is how the audio, audio says it. <laughs> I'm so glad you listened to the audio book because there's no way. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's Gargula. Mm -hmm. I pro uh, I'm probably butchering it, but continue. I mean, who wouldn't butcher? It's got an R, a J, a Z, and an L right next to each other. All those Gargula. hard consonants, they have no business being together. What is this? I know yeah. what it is, and I hate it. <laughs> uh, a red bolt flashed from his palm towards the elven lady, illuminating the trees with a bloody light. It struck her steed, and the horse toppled with a high-pitched squeal, plowing into the ground chest first. Yep. So you'll have to see it. He uses, uh, he does another spell, and which causes a quarter-mile section of the forest exploded into flames. And I think that's a good point, too, because... Like he shot a bolt and killed the horse, and you're like, "Whoa, that was that was dangerous." And mm -hmm. then he does that and like explodes a quarter of the forest, and it's like, "Oh, oh. like that's power." Like, so you... we're portraying not only is he a bad guy, this dude like is seriously powerful. Yeah, very like, yeah, very powerful, and 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 I would say not reckless, mm -hmm. but uh, absolutely does not care for any no collateral empathy. damage. No yep. empathy. No, no, there's no, no empathy or mm -hmm. caring in any of his. He doesn't care as long as he gets what he wants. Yeah, yeah. So the, eventually, the Urgles are able to. He with the, like blowing up parts of the forest, setting it on fire. The Urgles are able to corner her, and she's forced to run back towards the shade. Uh, he casts that lightning spell again. 
but this and time, he jumps like twenty feet. He, he jumps, jumps like twenty feet, twenty okay. feet, okay. and lands in front of her. He follows up onto a boulder, and yep. then he free falls <laughs> twenty feet up onto a boulder, and then a uh, parkour is over to where she's at. <laughs> And, like, he doesn't even, like, I don't even think it's described as, like, he climbs on top of this boulder and gets a whole view of this forest, which mm-hmm. he does very quickly. Mm-hmm. So we're getting, he's, and you know it's a he's tall he boulder. moves very fast. He is very uh-huh. dexterous. And then not only that, but he sets the fire, like, sets the giant fire. And then he also, it's mm-hmm. portrayed that he can sustain this fire because he watches to see if any of it falters. So that's mm-hmm. also kind of a hint that he can sustain and or fix what he did if it starts to falter so again super powerful Mm -hmm. and then he looks down and sees the elf and literally just jumps off he like doesn't go hop 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 he literally just 20 feet directly down just right in front of her and it's Mm -hmm. just like oh my god it's so bad and it doesn't kill him so again bad for your super powerful yeah right and so at this point we discover what it is he wants from her as the Urgle surged forward, the elf opened the pouch and reached, because she's been carrying a pouch this whole time. Yep. Uh, she reached into it and then let it drop to the ground. In her hands was a large sapphire stone that reflected the angry light of the fires. She raised it above her head, lips forming frantic words. Desperate, the shade barked, the spell I'm not going to try to say again. A red ball of frame, which is different than it was before, because beforehand he cast it and it was a, a red bolt. bolt. And now it's a red ball of flame. Uh, anyway, so a, a red ball of flame sprang from his hand and flew towards the elf fast as an arrow, but he was too late. A flash of emerald light briefly illuminated the forest, and the stone vanished. Then the red fire smote her, and she collapsed. And then he throws, like, a grade A Kylo Ren temper tantrum. Tantrum. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Just, he really does. Like, shoots nine bolts of energy from his palm, killed the Urgles instantly. Like, he kills... That's it, oh. right? He kills the rest of... He's also got, like, a boss ass sword yep with a mention. with a he's got a uh, uh he's got a sword with a a wire thin scratch ran along running along it and mm-hmm. that's foreshadowing <laughs> <laughs> he frog he which he didn't when he's mad that she got she like he's mad that she teleported the stone uh so he uh throws his sword into the tree blasts yep. off nine bolts of this magic pulls the yep. sword out of the tree grabs the elf throws her on a horse and he's like fine and just, <laughs> pretty much yeah. prophecies of revenge spoken in a wretched language only he knew rolled from his tongue i love that i love I do. that as a I sentence do. oh i do and mm-hmm. it's also like for for i don't know if it was for you because it's been longer for you since you read them mm-hmm. since it has Very with me time. i remember because later on i don't remember if it's this book or the next book but we get a vision of the shades past and for me that just kind of it's like a little peek into his back is a little bit of peek of his backstory it, i really like that and again like for me it's like oh i know this guy and again i don't like spo- a little spoilers i guess like for me it's like oh the shade's like a bad dude like really really bad there's like no redeeming qualities in him at all even from this beginning you're like oh no this is this guy's real Monstrous. bad i I can't help but feel a little bad for him just because I, I know the start. Mm-hmm. And like that's like, uh, but like if people getting in first into this, they don't know that. Of I, course. Yeah, I don't remember at all. Yeah. So they're very much just like, 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 oh, my God, this guy's awful and terrible. And I just have this small feeling of, ugh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> like not you, a bad, ugh, just like, a, ugh, my dude. Mm-hmm. Yeah. OK, well, one more thing with the whole like set apart, like yes, yes. making him inhuman. Uh, so his lips discussed Carl's lips before he turned back to the unconscious elf. Her beauty, which would have entranced any mortal man, held no charm for him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Gross. Right? <laughs> like, like the, it's the mild homophobia of establishing she's so hot, any mortal would love her. But I wouldn't. He doesn't dare because he's the villain. He, she does no, her beauty has no power over him. I s- I don't think it's intentional, but I think it is a trend of like, oh, the villain has no interest in pretty ladies. Mm. Okay. Okay. I can, I, it it took me a minute, but I got there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I can, I can see that. I don't think that's intentional. I think it's like a trope. I was going to say it's very tropey. It's Mm -hmm. very tropey where the villain can't be swayed by anything, including beauty or anything like that. So it is very tropey. It's a trope. But I do think it is a trope that is also used for like queer coding villains. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm going to listen again. I say thing, not necessarily bad. And, and a lot of the comments I'm going to make where it's like, I don't think that's good. Is it me being like Christopher Paolini needs to apologize? Nah, gang, this is just me hyperanalyzing the text. <laughs> this is me taking like my experiences and, and, and personal biases and knowledge and analyzing the shit out of the text because that's what I'm going to do here. <laughs> We're just like dissecting it and we're, then we're laying it out. It. And it's like, this could mean, it's, it's, it, this could be as straightforward as it is, but we're like, nah, we're going yeah, go to go down into, like, these why? rabbit holes. Because, <laughs> because it is specific of like another detail that is supposed to make this character like our villain. Mm-hmm. Like right out the gate, we know he's not human. And they're doing like the, all these things that are setting up him apart to establish him as the villain. And yeah. I think that's just and another it- layer. I agree. I also think it's also establishing the elves as well as Mm -hmm. being just these like gorgeous. Oh, so beautiful. So so beautiful. Like Mm -hmm. so pretty, so proud, so Mm -hmm. like poised and Mm -hmm. commanding because that's another thing where she is because I think the elves like whisper to each other and then she says something and then they change position. Yeah. But it's described rotation. Yeah. They're on rotation of, of their this patrol guide something guard uh guard convoy. guard convoy i think that mm-hmm. that works and or escort um, yeah yeah and i do think it's just interesting that oh god i lost my train of thought <laughs> can i interject while you're finding your train Yes. I think what I want to talk because we're about like done with the chat with the prologue, but I want to talk a little bit about this elven woman because we don't Mm -hmm. know her name yet. But like as we're like noting everything that's meant to tell us about our villain, I think it's Mm -hmm. like a lot in this chapter tells us a lot about her, though it's not from her POV. We get that she is like incredibly competent and incredibly dedicated to what she is doing because her two companions have fallen. She is upset about that. Like she is not unmoved by the loss. Yep. But she stops herself from running to him because she has something more important. And so we get that she because right at the gate when she's first described, she has a patch of the pouch in her lap and she keeps looking at it as if to make sure it's still there. So we get she is responsible for something incredibly important, thus making her somewhat of some degree of importance. And she's Mm -hmm. incredibly competent. Like they are ambushed. She reacts instantly. She runs. We know she like kills a bunch of the Urgles with her yep. sword. So she's like competent in combat. She is fierce. And then mm-hmm. when she is cornered, as would inevitably be, like it's like she didn't do anything wrong. Like this is what happened. She yep. acts fast and she gets the this, this stone away at the expense of herself. She does not try to flee. She doesn't teleport herself away. She, whatever nope. this thing is so important, she's willing to sacrifice herself for herself. its safety. Yep. And I think that's cool. We don't know who this 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 woman, this elven lady is, but all but uh, that's another thing. It's like I want to meet her. Like when do I get to meet her? What's her yeah. name? I want to. That's what you said. I think talking about your prologue and and fig, yeah, and like looking for these characters because when we get to the next chapter, she's not there. Nope. And so me as the reader, I'm like, but where's she at? Because now she's <laughs> taken prisoner by our very big bad villain, the Shade. And yeah. you're like, oh, and she's like- just he's mad, mad. Yeah. And it's 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 incredible. It's it does give you you a sense of almost urgency because mm-hmm. it, like we go from this like high stakes scene and then she's struck down and you're like oh my gosh and oh. then we cut to like very very low key yeah very quiet next chapter is like, very whoa. yeah it it's like it's like a the very stark uh, difference in what's happening mm-hmm. and so it's like wait wait what happened like go back like she's well, in no, wait, really wait, she's big in trouble. danger like yeah. oh no yeah, yeah. Exactly. and then like i don't know this kid it, i want to know her yep yep and so it is very it does it does bring that uh sense of urgency to it and it's also just like again like what you were saying with uh with this elf woman is like she's just so she's selfless she's brave she's like strong she's so she's just this badass woman and it's just like, whoa. And then she's struck down and you're like, no, <gasps> kind of stuff. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So it's very much like, but, but, but what happened? But what yeah. happened? Bring her back. Like, Bring can her, we, yeah. can, what happened? Yeah. Yep. And now we get to the part that the last thing that I really want to talk about for this chapter yeah. is this line. He convinced himself that the stone was gone and retrieved his horse from its hiding place among the trees. <laughs> There's this thing. That I know writers do, where you want to keep your reader in suspense. So you hide information from them. It annoys me when it's done as a lie. Mm-hmm. Because it's in the shade's POV. 
which means he has no business referring to it as a stone. Because he knows it's a dragon egg. Yep. <laughs> he should he say knows. egg. I get that we it's like wants to make us a surprise for in later chapters when we discover it's a dragon egg. Mm-hmm. And we discovered that's why he wanted it so badly. Yeah. But then a different word choice needed to be picked. This first description of it, Sharice into it, a uh, large sapphire orb. Yep. Oh, shoot. The large sapphire object. Or when he like looked and he's like, confirmed that his prize was gone. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Like, don't lie. Yeah, and, like, again, like, going back to me having never read this the first Mm -hmm. time, it was, I didn't get that. So I wasn't told from a figure who knew what that was and uh, going, so he knows, the shade knows it's an egg. And Uh I wasn't told that he knew that it was a stone, if that makes sense. Yeah, because he he, he referred to it. Yeah, because he referred to it as a stone. So that's like confirming, oh, it's a stone, and mm-hmm. then switching, just like thinking, oh, it's a stone. It's not really anything that because like, it's like going magic, on to the next, right? Yeah, because it's like, and then going on to like the other chapters, I was like, what is this stone? Like, because me, I was like, I had no no clue of any of this, and mm-hmm. so I was like, what is this stone? This is a weird looking stone, and for me, I was like, it's got to be the dragon egg, right? Because I'm yeah, because like, you one, know it's like it's an egg. Yeah, it's uh, that, and it's also like there's a big blue dragon on the front of the book. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's it's got to be a dragon egg. But for me, it was very much like I fucking knew it kind of thing. Oh, yeah, it was very much like I don't know because like I think I also think it would have made more of an impact with being like he confirmed the egg was gone, and then we switch, and then Aragon starts referring to it as a stone, and we're like, mm. wait, 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 no, it's not a stone though. Nope. Like we were yeah. just like, so we're in suspense and waiting for him to discover mm-hmm. that it's an egg, and he only does it uh, when we yeah read later on. I so I feel like yeah, that would have that would have made a more suspenseful. F- I feel like that would have been more suspense mm-hmm. because we would have been like, egg- and it's also like, I mean, we can get into this like later on, but when. I'm not, I, we'll, we'll talk about that later okay. on, but like when he tries to do something to the egg, it would have created more urgency for us. Like, what are you doing? Don't do that. Like, you don't know what you have. Please don't do that. Yes. Kind of thing. I, I think so. that's a great point. Yeah. Rather than like hide what it is, like say yeah. it's an egg. Cause that's, as we discussed it, like at the top, talking about when you do a prologue and stuff, mm-hmm. I think we'll also do a prologue when you want to give the reader information that your main characters are not going to have Mm -hmm. for quite a while. Yeah. And so in doing so, you make certain sacrifices about mystery. And so starting the prologue from the Shade's point of view, who has more information than our hero is going to have, we as the reader should be told, you're absolutely right, Lucy, he should say the egg. In fact, it should be like the sapphire, a large sapphire egg. And then this last one should be like, he confirmed that the dragon egg was gone. Like, yeah. oh, my God. Like, that's way more like that. That would have been like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Just a dragon yeah. egg. Yeah. Oh, you're. Yeah. That's exactly I think, it. I like, think whoa. I think it would have just made it more. Because we know the imp- stakes. Yeah. Because it's like it's the same thing we were talking about the woman elf where it cuts away and you're like, oh, my gosh, she's in danger. And it cuts away and you're just like, wait. You just said dragon egg. Like, dragon wait, egg. wait. You just said dragon what? egg. You just, what? you're just going to leave at that? Like, what? Like, yeah. yeah, exactly. Like, just heighten it. And and yeah. then I think you're exactly right when we get to our, our Aragon who doesn't know what it is and is calling Absolutely it a stone. Not. But it would be described the same way. And we would, like, the reader's smart enough to get it's the same object. Yes. And that does create the narrative irony. That's something yeah. like that. Because, and it, I, I, I finally figured out, like, uh, I was trying to, I think I was trying to get to this earlier. When oh, we did you find your train? About- a little, uh, yeah. maybe not that train, but a different train. <laughs> so, like we were ta- when we were talking about the importance of including or excluding prologues, mm-hmm. I do, th- I do think a prologue is like the author and the reader having a sidebar. Like, S- oh my gosh, like look quick. at this and look at this. Like, oh, can you see that? And da da da. Like almost like spoiling some things. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, and then I'm going to take you into the chapter where no one knows anything. Mm-hmm. And then we cut to chapter but one. You and no get one knows, to know. But you get to know. Mm-hmm. So like it's, it's kind of like that. Yeah, exactly. I like that a lot. I like that mm-hmm. approach of and that's, I think that's a great approach when like considering if you're like a writer or a creative storyteller, if you're considering a prologue or something, like does your story need it and does it make it stronger if you're gonna hey, come over here real quick. 
You see that? That's a dragon egg. Yeah. <laughs> All right, watch this. Exactly. Watch what happens next. Watch what happens next. You're never going to believe it. Yeah, exactly. And so, and I, and it's like, you don't have to spoil everything. Like, yeah, because we don't he, know like, why he wants it or where she's yeah, taking it. Exactly. And you don't know, like, any names. Like, they, uh, Paolini does a good job. He doesn't give anybody's names. Mm-hmm. We don't really know. We know nothing about these characters except the shade is heartless. Mm-hmm. The elf woman is fearless and she's compassionate, unlike mm-hmm. the shade, because she yeah. did mourn her loss where he doesn't care if the Urgles die and proceeds to kill the surviving ones when mm-hmm. they displease him. Mm-hmm. And so but it's like we don't know anything else like at all. Like we don't know her importance if she's even important or like because like we're also described the elf male the man uh, the male elves the male elves are mm-hmm. described with having crowns and stuff so it's like oh my gosh were they important like yeah what is we don't really know what's going on so a prologue it, i do like I, is it like a sidebar but it's like i'm gonna tell you this one thing but i'm not gonna tell you everything yeah you still get to have mystery but i want you yeah. to have enough to know like it's it's to tantalize the reader you give them just enough information that they want to know more yeah so Yep. Yeah, it, the, the shade knows it's an egg. Just pay a lady, it's an egg. Just say it's an egg. <laughs> it's dragon an egg. egg. It's Just say the, the words dragon an egg. egg. Let us, come on, you got a bunch of fantasy nerds, dragon egg. Let's yep. go. Not that he needs any of our advice, obviously not. I know, Disney, right? oh He's getting gosh. a Disney Plus series. Yep. So. Yep. I think that feels like a good a good place to end off our, for our prologue discussion. Listen, you have to say yes. anything else. Nope, I got, I don't have, let me look through my notes. Nope, I don't think so. I think that was that was pretty much it. Tight. Dear listeners, thank you, thank you so much for joining us on this first step of our journey through the inheritance cycle. Woo! Woo! <laughs> first episode, obviously, of we going to jump into this. Uh, there's a lot of chapters in these books, so we'll be doing this for yes. quite a while. So we absolutely want to hear from you. What can we do to structure the show uh, for your listening experience? How mm-hmm. do you want us to, at the top say Here's what the episode, like, here's the chapter beat by beat and then go into it. Like, what do you like in your read along podcast? Let us know. Like I said, we've got a, we have an Instagram. You can hit us up at Aragon Pod or you can email us directly at AragonPod at gmail.com. Links in the show notes. Boop, boop. And we will be back next week. It's a weekly podcast. Uh, until then, she's Lucy Hart. And she is Darian Smart. And this was Aragon. And back again. 